Perfect. Okay. So we heard, we've heard a lot of good talks already so far about fat grafting fillers, and I, I would actually concur with a lot of the speakers. And what the goal of this short talk is to really focus on patient communication. I think it's the most important thing that we do. If we set up the expectations appropriately, we can not only get great results, but through great results and great communication, we can get very satisfied patients. I really believe that uh, the cannula has really come to replace, sorry, this didn't show up there on the, on the slide for some reason, but the cannula really is, to me, changed my makeup of what I do in my business, where my fat grafting has gone down a lot in terms of volume, uh, I guess pun intended or no pun intended, and, and really fillers have taken a much higher uh, uh, percentage of my business. So we're going to talk about three models of communication that I use every day with my patients so they understand what the, the pros and cons of each of these technologies are. Could you reset the clock for me, if you don't mind? So one is a glass of water, second is a bed, and the third is a house on sand. So I always like to say that an education is told before a procedure and an excuse is told after the procedure. And it is so much better to give an education than to give an excuse. So the glass of water emptying to me is perhaps a very easy way for an individual to understand durability of the procedure. So when we're younger and very, we're too full, and then when we get older, we start to lose volume, so we pass through a point of ideal. And as you may have heard in my earlier talk, I believe that period of time, maybe in the early 30s for most women, when there's a little bit of sculpting, and that progresses in nature uh, in a, on an ongoing basis. So for me, a fat graft is not going to get you a perfect result. Why is that? Because there is some variable resorption. It is something that, in addition to being variable resorption, is a very soft treatment modality, plays deeply. So it doesn't have the accuracy of filling a face with perfection. But I believe that it, also, it offers truly benefit in the sense that it just creates a wonderful foundation for the whole face. And so I look at it as an 80-20, where fat grafting is going to get me to 80%. And I really believe that I always tell my patients all my surgeries are going to get you to near perfect but not perfect and I may have to do some fillers to adjust those things. So I like to use fillers in people that are under 40 because I, talk, I mentioned before fat grafting has some variability in terms of the uh, fact that it's bioactive and so when you gain weight there's a, there's a there is a risk of that fat becoming more exuberant over time. And so fillers are bioinert and they, you don't require as much. So I think for those two reasons is very helpful. And so cost is one thing if you're younger. The, the cost benefit ratio is lower when you're doing fillers. When you're older and you need a lot of volume, to me there's nothing like fat, where you can really develop a beautiful result very, very quickly. But also, in addition to that, we think about recovery. The red balloon is recovery. Fat does give you a, a much larger single recovery period, but we don't think about it that fillers, a lot of little filler touch-ups here and there in the office can add cost and a lot of micro-recoveries, which may uh, overwhelm what a fat graft could do uh, overall. I have no financial affiliations with any of the companies, as you've heard in my previous talk about an hour ago. Uh, for me, I really like sculpting with Artifil in the upper face, and I like Voluma now that it's entered the market in the, the mid to lower face. And if not, uh, my second choice is Belterra on the upper face and Juvederm Ultra in the, in the lower face. So that concept is, is, for me, fillers is less expensive and bioinert for someone a little bit younger. Fat is less expensive and may have other benefits. I, I would be hard pressed to try to sell a stem cell type uh, facelift, but I, and I, always, I, I almost never mention that, but I, if, if anything, I try to undersell it to a patient. So the next thing I like to do is, and I use this almost every single day, the face is like a bed. And what that concept is, is that there is multi levels to a, to a bed, and I know that typically the sheets may be under the duvet, but for the sake of argument, we'll say that the sheets are above the duvet, above the mattress. And for me, fat really is the, the mattress. It's placed deeply, it's soft, it's, it's far away from your target zone. So if you really want a nasolabial groove knocked out with accuracy or the skin crease knocked out, you're not going to do well with fat. It's, it's very unreliable in that method. But if you want to change the blink where someone just looks sub substantially softer and more youthful and better, fat is amazing. And so that's how I look at it. It's a, it's a mattress for the face. The duvet are going to be a little errors in the face, a little fold here, a little groove there. And for me, fillers are fantastic. So I tell every patient that gets fat, expect to do some fillers 
uh, you know, at an extra expense, somewhere at six months to a year and a half as that fat matures and we see some areas that we need to touch it up. And then the sheets, I don't believe you can really manage the, the, the skin surface with fillers that well. I think you, what you need to do is neuromodulators and, and you need uh, skin resurfacing of some kind. I like fractionate CO2 and erbium. But there are many ways to, to, to skin a cat, many ways to do this. These are just my philosophical constructs. So the last analogy here that I like to uh, tell patients, so a lot of times you have patients come in and say, you know what, let me just give a try for some fillers, and then, I, then I'll consider the fat. And I don't like that, that sequence, and the reason for that is if we do you know, a lot of fillers, and for me to get a really beautiful result, I need, a, I need a decent number of syringes to get that result. One or two is probably not gonna cut it. They do one or two, that's fine, but if they do enough that I think they're gonna look great, I'm worried that I'm building a house on sand. What that means, basically, is if I'm building uh, fillers, which are usually, if I'm using temporary fillers, which are the sand, the brown on the bottom, and, and they're in a process of leaving, then I'm putting fat on it. I don't like that for a few reasons. One is, I don't know when the, the fillers are going out, and I don't think you should go in there hyaluronidase the everything, because there's unpredictable dissolution of the product. So I don't like that sequence. If someone's had a lot of fillers, I usually don't offer them fat. I usually move toward fillers. In addition to that, as I told you, the fat is a mattress. It's a, it's a good foundation work. Fillers are a great top off. So if I'm going from an, a highly accurate, precise, expensive thing to a global volumizer on top, I don't like that order of sequence. So I, I liken it to building a house on sand because the sand is constantly dissolving and your house is collapsing. Uh, if you're talking about putting fat on fat, we've heard a little bit about secondary uh, fat grafts. I've done that. Typically when I do that is a patient that may be from out of town. I haven't seen them in five years. Uh, they haven't maintained themselves with, with fillers and they just lose a lot of volume and they get a lot older. That person, a secondary fat graft works very well for, but it's a minority of cases. In general, I believe if we try to use fat as a filler, we're not gonna get the results because we're constantly chasing our own tail. And then we, we risk is an overfilled result and it's the last thing you want. And then fat uh, fillers, temporary fillers on top of fat is fantastic because then I'm basically adjusting my fat with some micro treatments of, of hyaluronic acid of some kind and I think it's fantastic. A um, lot of patients that do fat, which is durable and permanent, want a permanent filler on top of that, and I love that. I think this is really, really wonderful because then you got durability on top of durability, minus progression of aging, and it, I think it works very, very well. Fat on top of a permanent filler, unless someone's coming in and doing just a couple syringes of a permanent filler, let's say periorbitally, I don't like it because permanent fillers are more expensive, and if they globally fill their face, and then now they're doing this inaccurate fat graft on top of that, remember inaccurate, what I mean by that is it's gonna create a nice soft tissue envelope, but it's not gonna necessarily fix all these flaws. They may be disappointed, and it may be a very expensive route to take. So in general, even though this is not building a house on sand, I don't like the sequence. I like the sequence of fat as a foundation work and then coming up and touching it up. So remember, that fat is permanent, but it's not. That's like anything else. There's a progression of aging. And I really believe that the solar elastosis, the dyschromias, and all the things that are associated with sun damage is to me worse than almost anything else you can do. It's, to me, it's almost worse than smoking. It's worse than diabetes. It is the single strongest factor for me to look at progression of aging. And what that means is it's not just statically what exposure you had in the last year. It's what you had in the last decade. So you got to look forward and say, oh, you've been having a lot of sun exposure even a decade ago. That's going to translate into progression of aging, which I'm going to have a hard time overcoming with fat grafting and fillers. And that's when I see a patient five years out, it looks like they've lost a lot of their volume, either from fillers or fat grafting, it's because of progression of aging, where I've also seen patients a decade out look phenomenal. And that's because they don't have that antecedent degree of uh, volume, volume uh, loss risk that is with, with, um, with, with a lot of sun damage from before. And so these model of discussion, I believe, is just a way that you can use to discuss things with patients. And I really believe patient communication is the cornerstone to achieving great results. And so if they work for you, great. You know, if they don't work for you and this is not something you want to use, that's reasonable as well. So these are just some examples you saw earlier. For me, um, fillers can be done very, very effectively as a standalone modality. Or if I'm uh, gonna do uh, fat grafting, it works great by itself. But sometimes fat grafting um, you know, you, you need a little touch-up. Example, here is a lady that, you know, it's a little bit less impressive under the eyes and, you know, around the jawline. So I came back and did a little touch-up to further finesse this. 
And this is from beginning to end. So this is that 80-20 idea. So you don't always strike 100% with fat. And there's another lady here, I apologize, she has a little bit more eye makeup. But this is just a nicer, softer result after fat grafting. I came back and I just touched up a little bit with some fillers around the eyes and the, and the mouth and softened it further. And this is from beginning to the end. And I think there's a stepwise approach. And if you do it this way, I think you, you can en enhance patient satisfaction. Book on fat grafting I wrote. And I just encourage you all to be artists in what you do. Thank you.